All right, something has started. Let me just open up my editors. Okay, so what are the most common things you do when you open? Yes? Sure. One second. Let's see if I can. You should have joined the group plus hang out so I can share your screen. So we have to have somebody out there. Okay. One second. Yeah, don't worry about switch. Okay, let's increase the font size if possible. Is it increasing it? There we go. Yep. Well, that's not doing anything. Oh, you gotta have hold shift and probably. Is that big enough? One more. Here, okay. One more. For it to be larger. Let us know now, please. One more. That's good. All right. So, what are the most common things that people do with the settings up PHP file? You know, you can add your database. And that's one big thing that's changed between Drupal 6 and Drupal 7. In the past, it used to be, well, essentially just one line. Uh, you would have, what was it? Actually, let me see if I have an old one. Open file. Site. Sites default. Ah, oh, brother. Does anybody need to sign up this? All right. So in the past, you had this global variable called db underscore URL. And in that, you basically specified whether you're dealing with a MySQL database or a Postgres database, and if you were unlucky, a DB2 database. Um, and it consisted of having a username, a password, where the database is located, and the name of the database, and that's it. Um, you couldn't really, you could kind of specify other databases, but it didn't really do much. But with Drupal 7, since it has the ability for you to be able to specify a master database and a slave database, and do various other things with it, and it has support for other types of drivers, it is a little bit more complex than before. So now databases are arrays. Much like everything else in Drupal, it's either an object or an array. Um, and to specify the defaults for each one, you would specify a database at default. At default, um, you specify what kind of driver it is. And in this case, now it supports MySQL, SQLite, Postgres, um, I believe MS SQL, though it might be an extra, extra module or something that's available on Drupal.org, and I think a couple of others. And if you wanted to specify if you're dealing with like a slave database, you just have default and slave. So, you know, you just add another one down here, and it kind of takes care of it for you. You automatically have everything set up. And that's probably the biggest change, but yes, Pete? Would that slave be on a remote network computer? It could, yes. It would be on a separate server, and it would be synced up proper. Like, you have to take care of making sure that your slave database is actually um, slave uh, yes, in slave mode, and it's syncing up correctly with your master database. Otherwise, you're going to run into some issues. Um, but there are a couple of other things that have also changed. Um, they have tried to make user registrations and the passwords that come out of it more secure. So now you can actually provide a salt hashing file. And do people know what um, salts are? Um, no one raised their hand, so. <laughs> Wait, what was the question? Sorry. Uh, do people know what salts are in passwords? Uh, I see a few hands up. Well, basically, they are a way to um, 
you would combine it with another user specified password and then you would hash that so then when someone's trying to uh, you know get into your site or whatever they can't just use a conventional rainbow table attack and try and guess what the password might be it's a little bit more difficult in that case and it's probably one of the one of the other changes that's in there and aside from that a lot of it is still the same you can still use a configurations array again to um, make settings what do you say to override any settings that might otherwise be in the database so what does that mean so let me just close down these windows so I'm on my standard Drupal installation and all right well that's a little big so now I'm logged in and I see this theme that's in there and you know let's say someone is able to log in and they can come in and say oh I don't really like that theme let me change it This is taking a while. My laptop's going to die soon, so I'll have to be quick. Do you have power? I don't have power. But anyways, so in this case, you know, you have some person that, you know, might be an administrator on your site but doesn't know any better, and they just change the theme of your of your site. So the next time someone comes there, you know, they're like, what the heck's going on? So there's an easy way to be able to get around it. Uh, one second, let me just see the settings. So if I scroll down in the settings file for, let's see. In settings.php, they actually tell you uh, one of the variables that you can set to make your, uh, to close, to lock down on your theme. And let me just see if we can find it. Here we go. So that variable is called theme default in this case. And, you know, I want to change it back to always remain at start. So now if I go back to my site and look at it, it's in start. And no matter what I change this to at this point, like if I try and change Bartik back in, it won't do it. It'll still remain at start. And yes, uh, finish. I just wanted to offer something to that. Oh no, go ahead. Uh, so this is actually one of the things that I did recently for a very large client. They wanted to have a mobile edition of their website. So instead of really kind of jumping in and doing a bunch of crazy stuff and changing uh, like a lot of logic on their theme, we actually just created a uh, another site in the sites folder for the mobile subdomain. It literally shares the same database. So the settings PHP file is almost exactly the same as the main website. The only difference is the default theme points to the mobile version theme that we made. And we didn't have to do any special configuration. Literally, Drupal just manages itself. And we did redirection for mobile devices up on uh, the load balancer. So we did something a little bit higher to know where to send the user to. But it was, it was so easy. And this forces that they can't try to accidentally change the mobile site, even when they jump into the administration or anything. So I, I definitely really like this approach, uh, especially if you have a client that could be a little bit dangerous. You know, uh, even a little is a lot, in my opinion. So this helped me out a lot for some mobile project that I recently had. Yeah, and it's an easy way to be able to try and clamp down on, you know, it, let's say if other modules offer some sort of UI or whatever it might be, you can, you can try and disable those and just set whatever settings that it might have otherwise offered directly in your settings.php file. So you don't get to see it on to even be able to try and change it, but even if, you know, they were able to somehow get to it, you're still safe. And, whoa, that was interesting. <laughs> His laptop's making some interesting noises. <laughs> yes? Can you still uh, force a login to user one for uh, when you totally forget your password and you can't figure out the password password? Probably could. <laughs> People can guess at it. <laughs> Did you want to add something to no, it? I okay. Mean, that's a question. Okay. 
What was the question? Can people still log in as used for one? No. Can, uh, can you force a log? You know, the. Oh. I remember in the old days, the great trick when you could not remember what the password <laughs> is for the <laughs> site you're building. Right. You could just force a, a login and uh, set that PHP to user one mm -hmm. and hope that nobody grabbed it before you did. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know. Uh, what? Drush 5 can let you reset it. That's going to say, wouldn't, yes. that, wouldn't that set everybody as user one? Mm -hmm. That would yeah. set everybody. Essentially, yeah. yeah. Just, okay. You just you have to change the settings. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, I, get it. Okay. I so, thought that was one of the most bizarre tricks I've ever seen. <laughs> You could also block IPs, and other things that you could do is you could set, let's say you're on in your own development environment. Uh, this is one easy area to be able to disable caching. Um, this is something that I was talking about with Mike Stewart. And, you know, sometimes you want to ensure that nothing gets cached, that you're, you know, you're always seeing, you know, you're always getting a slow site. And the way to do that in... In this now, just as an example, in this case, I'm going to change gears a bit. Instead of have, uh, I've been trying to test around and play with uh, Mongo for one of my sites. And so I wanted to try out, you know, what caching with Mongo is like. So what you can do is you can actually specify multiple caching backends to Drupal. So in this case, it's $conf and cache back backends. And you give it an array format and you give it the path to the file that holds that particular caching style. So in this case, in this case, I have sites, all modules, contrib, mongo, mongo cache. But if I wanted to, I could add a second one. Cache backends is equal to, let me just remember its name now. Ah, there we go. Includes slash cache install dot inc. And this is actually a fake cache that Drupal provides for you. So if you didn't want to cache anything, you can actually use this particular cache. So in the next line after that, you can say what your default caching class is going to be. And that's how all of the caches are now defined. They're defined as classes. And in the case of Mongo, they're calling it Drupal Mongo DB cache. But in the case of the fake one, they actually call it Drupal fake cache. So what I could do if I wanted to is you know, dollar conf cache page is equal to this particular one. So if an anonymous user comes to the site or you know if I'm logged out, it's gonna try and store all of this all of the page caches into a fake cache so it doesn't exist. So they're gonna keep getting served a um, a page that's getting generated again and again. Right, let's take that out. And you can, well, let's see. Sorry if I'm going a little bit slowly today. Or you want to jump on the site PHP soon. Yeah, that's what I'm going to go into next. All right, so I saved it. And if I go into my mongodb.local great so in this case it's it's using the mongodb cache to actually serve serve the page for most of it uh, let's see I can kind of try and show it from here as well It's not quite viewable from in here, but if you actually look, there aren't any calls to cache get or cache set within the list of queries that are being generated. So there are 26 queries. And if I turned it off, let's see, it should make a difference. Let's see, 70 queries. So it's making a, a sizable difference. And finally, let's get into sites.php. And does anyone? Yes, Oliver? I just wanted to add another thing that I use. Some use a similar approach, but I'll, I'll like if I have a, 
development environment where I want a number of modules turned off yes. or or, mm -hmm. like, um, or on, like the or like um, like on my live side, I use some certain security modules, and I, when I'm doing development, I don't want them turned on. Mm -hmm. I can just do all that in settings. If I want to uh, set preset certain variables, I can do that. Um, if, I, if I want to use a different uh, files directory, I can just preset my local files directory mm -hmm. as one of the variables. So I can kind of pre-configure my environment uh, with this file so that even as I'm going up and down, I don't have to keep switching. Yeah. 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 The pump you get as long as people really need because there is there shouldn't be a concern of am I putting too many things in my settings file. You know, it's, it's a small PHP file, it's, it's not logic, you know, they're just literally value attributes to stuff. What, so what, don't what, fear what, about trying stuff out there. Let, let me add to this real quick. One of the reasons we actually brought this up is this is not, as a beginner, this isn't something we necessarily know, but this is a real trick that a lot of people that work with Drupal all the time use. And one of the things that's really key about doing this with messing with the settings files, you can mess with it in the development environment and not accidentally push it out to production. So if you're using local development where you might be in a, a utilizing Drupal multi-site capabilities, like you, you have a local host folder or something that isn't going to, uh, uh, oh man, resolve, there we go. That isn't going to resolve to the, to the production server, that, that's where this is really powerful. You know, typically, if you use Git to deploy or something like that, you exclude the settings.php <laughs> file. So you can have your settings.php files in all your different deployments uh, and uh, staging sites and dev sites and whatever. They can all be different. And it's on you, of course. Do you have another comment right there? No, I was the final topic. Oh. Hi, Tom. Well, a cool thing I'd learned from Cristofano was that you include a settings.inc file for things that you want to share across different environments. So you can have different whatever variables that you want, and you can specifically have them in there, uh, so that even though you're not committing your settings.php file to the code base, you have this one particular file that's ensuring that certain things are the same across the various uh, uh, across the different developer sites or the production site. Which is often where you might have a develop module turned on. Right, something. precisely. Speaking of sites, let's jump into that file. All right. <laughs> so who has played around with the sites.php file? All right, three people. Um, so there is a very good reason for using the settings up or the sites.php file. And that's to basically try and ensure that, you know, if you're moving across different environments, let's say, it's still going to utilize the same directory for searching against for settings.php or, or whatever else you might have. So, like in this case, I had a standard.local site and I had a, and a mongodb.local site. But let's say they're really supposed to be pointing to the same thing. sites mongodb.local is equal to standard.local. So with one line, well hopefully, let's see, there we go. With one line, I'm if I've effectively switched my site over into a different um, well into a different Drupal installation. And this is useful like the way I use it is uh, we have our main CalArts site. So then in my sites.php, I might have dev.calarts.edu is still pointing at the calarts.edu folder. And then, you know, same with my, and then once I'm at the calarts.edu stage, then it's still going to be looking at the same thing. And this is a way for me to be able to work with, you know, like when I'm initially working on the site, people can add content to it, all of that stuff. And then so then that way, um, when I'm moving it over into the live environment, I don't really have to fiddle around and change other things. That's about it. Any any questions? Yes. Um, does adding anything to sites PHP uh, give you any performance boost uh, for Drupal? I'm just I'm just kind of being. Not that I've noticed. No. It's well, yes. Would, it is so long as what you're putting in there is not in your database. Yeah. yeah. 
put it in code, then it'll be faster, but that's, that's it. Uh, mm -hmm. The question was more of, uh, instead of Drupal's auto-discovery of the sites, you know, that are in the sites folder, you know, for setting comps, oh, okay. you know, it, does this give me anything, you know, over that old method? It's marginally faster. It's, right. it's, it's not a big difference. Um, like I said, it's mainly for the environment purposes that, that this works out better. And, I mean, it, there's a little bit more logic to it. Like, if you're looking at it, this is an easier area to look at for these kind of settings as opposed to elsewhere. Yes? Uh, so I'm a big fan of Drush, as some of you know. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, Drush alias system, uh, you know Drush aliases? I covered that in uh, one of our last meetups. Okay. Uh, the site's PHP clockers, I have not played with it in V7 myself, mm -hmm. I'll be honest. Uh, does it... Um, does it affect me generating aliases for, you know, what I used to have, you know, say, PHP file? Because, you know, an alias would look up the, the connection file, you know, the connection string for MySQL, so it would know how to connect to that database that mm -hmm. just the alias. And I'm wondering now, does it cascade the data enough over where Drush aliases will pick up that connection string from? It will. Okay. It I does. That was much. I just to add. Yeah. So, I mean, even in my local environment, like, we have... Uh, amod like amod.redcat.org or whatever, but I can put in drush redcat.org and it'll, because I have it all in my sites.php file, it'll go to the appropriate settings.php, like it'll discover itself correctly. And yeah, then I can keep working with it uh, as normal. And, yeah. and that's about it, unless any there are any questions, other questions. Comments, tips to share? It's pretty straightforward. It's very straightforward. <laughs> what was the purpose for sites.php um, if, you know, there wasn't really kind of a big, I, I guess I would say, you know, kind of more key reason to use it, you know, for performance? I think, like I said, it's mainly for people that are wanting to organize their environments and things like that. Like, I mean, I've had to do it where I'm trying to do sim links or other kinds of, other kinds of wacky stuff to try and match up whatever was in my production site onto my local onto my local machine and uh, so, if, yes. so if somebody's used to like setting up sim links kind of you know yes you know some voodoo you know and they're kind of uh, their file set up in structures for full on Drupal sites uh, if they're going to start a new v7 site for the first time whether it's multi-site or not would you suggest they still look at sites.php you know? sites.php would be the first place that they should look instead of starting to set up all of the sim links even if it's not multi-site right even if yes you like even for even for a local site, it's you're you're better off just trying to work through the size of PHP. Uh, Thanks. Makes me to stay away from some links on production. Why? You take a performance hit. It's a serious performance hit on Apache. Yeah, that's if you got mm -hmm. Apache responding. Okay, but yeah, that's probably one of the reasons that they. I I, I actually don't know the history behind sites of PHP. But you do want to stay away from some links. It's just one extra big hit. I mean, it's not huge, but it's another jump to go. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Apache has to do a whole bunch of rights checking every time you throw a link. So sites might let you get away from having to do a bunch of that kind of grungy work with that. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Cool. Any other questions? Otherwise, we'll move on. No. Thank you. Thank you.